I like it when preachers agree, especially on important matters relating to the scriptures. And Pastor Cooley and I, we kind of trade things back and forth, and we are, we are in agreement. Saved people are the ones who keep believing what God said. That's who the saved people are. They don't, it's not a one time I believe the Bible that one day. It's not once prayed, always saved. Saved people who believe the Bible when they kneel before the cross... They believe the Bible the next day. Ten years later, they believe the Bible. Forty years later, they still believe God's Word. And when God calls them home, they called home believing what God said in His Word. You'll find saints buried with the Bible in their hand. Amen to that. That's what I believe. Uh, Genesis 3. And we get... We get pounded by people that they say, Oh, you, you prayed that prayer that one time. Well, you're saved forever. Doesn't matter what you do now. You're still going to heaven. That ain't what the Bible says. And we don't follow some denomination's doctrinal statement on salvation, we believe what the scriptures say about salvation. Amen? Genesis 3, and this is, this is kind of part of it. The gospel uh, was introduced really the first time in Genesis 3, uh, 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It meaning her seed, Christ, shall bruise thy head, serpent, thou shalt bruise his heel, Christ. And that's, they call that the Proto-Evangelion. The first gospel show up in the Bible, Genesis 3.15. It's the promise that God will defeat Satan in the end. At the end of my life, whenever that day is, I want to still be believing and trusting in the cross so that there's no mistaking. There's no misunderstanding. I, I know a preacher, and he was a friend of mine. He ended up he ended up cheating on his wife. He repented of it, stepped down from the ministry, and worked on restoring his marriage, making it right. And I received word one day that he had passed away. He was in a car accident. And the indication was that he had had a heart condition and the, they determined that he went into cardiac arrest while he was driving and died. And because of that, his car crashed. He didn't die because of the car crash. He died because of cardiac arrest. I believe he's in heaven because he sought forgiveness and redemption from Jesus Christ and it's obvious that God was done with him in his work here. Um, but I believe God could have restored him fully to continue the work. Preachers make mistakes. They're, not, they're humans. They're, they're not infallible beings. And uh, I've never, that's always, I went to his funeral. That's, and um, I appreciate the man that preached his sermon and preached his funeral because I believe he was right. He left this world still believing the word of God. That's what it takes. Genesis 3, verse 6. And I'm going to focus on 
the three aspects or three parts of sin. And you see it here in Genesis 3. When the woman saw that the tree was, number one, good for food. That it was pleasant to the eyes. And number three, a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof. And did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. And I believe there's a little foreshadowing here. If I see Eve as the church, Adam would be a picture of Christ. But in this aspect, I see Christ who did no sin and yet the sins of his bride laid upon him when he went to the cross thus achieving salvation for his bride so there's a little bit of that here the eyes of them both were opened and I want you to notice and they knew that they were naked now we're not going to talk about that tonight but I will probably I will probably look at that next Sunday night if I remember it if God leads me in that direction there is shame with sin. Shame with sin. It brings shame. And God has a way of exposing our sins. Does he not? We stand naked before God. There's nothing that he doesn't see about us. And they sewed fig leaves together. There was a Singer sewing machine store just down the road there. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. That was man's attempt at covering his own sin. And it failed. It doesn't work. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you Lord for meeting with us this afternoon. We love you. We ask for your presence to be with us today we ask that your holy spirit come in this room and fill our hearts with wisdom knowledge understanding and father manifest the fruits of the spirit in our lives so that when our funeral is preached there's no misunderstanding there's no, no one who says, well, I hope they made it. Father, manifest the fruit of the Spirit in our lives so that people will know what we know, that Jesus still saves and we still trust in Him. Father, bless us as we go through Your Word tonight. Give us grace and understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said... Amen. But I want to focus on these three things that God shows us here. Turn to um, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. I don't have this in my notes. I don't know why I must have overlooked it, but I've uh, made mention of this several times. The contrast between Eve's failure... And Christ's victory. So Eve was in the garden. She was surrounded by the food that God had given her and Adam. She probably was not hungry, although the Bible doesn't say that. But we just get this idea. She's surrounded by food. She has plenty to eat from. She's got a lot there for her. But then the devil draws out this desire in her maybe maybe it was pro and there's no doubt it was there all the time but the devil's job is to draw that out of us to try to draw our attention away from god away from his word away from his work in our life his ministry what god is doing in our lives in our families our church our nation to get us away from that to draw us to sin that's his role that's his position 
So it, he, it worked with Eve. Eve, he went after the weaker vessel, not the strong. He didn't go after Adam, he went after Eve. And I believe he knew that he could get her. And he did. He got her. She fell into lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Even though she, I don't think she was hungry. I think she just, and my wife always mentions this. We'll come out of a restaurant, belly's full, drive by another restaurant, and I'll smell it, and I'll go, man, that smells good. My wife will say, you just ate. Yeah, but. I didn't eat that. That's our nature. Mom, that's what's in us. We have, but we want more. Jeff Bezos, $160 billion in his hand. His worth. No man, to my knowledge, has ever attained that much wealth in America. $160 billion. One of the wealthiest men alive. Is he retiring? He's pushing for more. And that's our nature. We desire what God says we cannot have. And God's watching out for us. God knows what's going to happen to us. So Luke chapter 4... Even though, you listen to this now, even though Jesus is weak from fasting 40 days, look at what the, well, look at what verse 1 says. Read that. What is he full of? The Holy Ghost. When you are full of the Holy Ghost, you don't want what the devil offers. You don't want it. You don't need it. Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days, he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. My goodness, I would have been hungry at noon the first day. You ever tried fasting? I, I, you ought to fast. I'm going to probably teach on fasting sometime, but you ought to fast. But I guarantee you, the devil at noon will say, come on. Let's go eat. So Jesus was hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Lust of the flesh. Lust of the flesh. Jesus answered him, said, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Well, that didn't work. The devil taking him up unto a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Lust of the eyes. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that it is, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. He, he wasn't lying. He is the God of this world. He controls the cities, the towns, the nations, the kingdoms. For a temporary time, he does. And I, you know what I believe. I believe that in, that in that event, in that moment, the devil in the spirit showing Jesus every kingdom of the world, past, present, future, having that ability to see all of those kingdoms in all of time, saying, these are mine. I'll give them to you if you will worship me. Jesus, verse 9, answered and saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. It both times now is quoted from Deuteronomy, fifth book of the Bible. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God. He's questioning, always questioning, always trying to put doubt in our minds. The devil will suck faith right out of us. Will he not? He will fill our hearts with disbelief, not belief. If thou be the Son of God. Um, 
Cast thyself down from hence. Verse 10. For it is written. Now he's going to pull scripture out on him. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up. Lest at any time thou shalt. Thou dash thy foot against a stone. And the devil stopped right there. He kept reading. And he will trample dragons and serpents under your feet. I'm paraphrasing. But that's, that's how that scripture keeps going on. The devil conveniently stopped when it satisfied what he wanted out of it. So understand this. The devil, listen now, the devil will isolate portions of Scripture out of the context to deceive people. That's how he does it. You'll, I've got, I'm not kidding you, I bought three jo- uh, Joyce Meyer books at Goodwill Friday. And she is a master with words and witchcraft. And she deceives, and all that crowd deceives by pulling bits of Scripture out of the context of the whole of the Scripture. To make the Bible say what the Bible does not really say. Or alters the text to conveniently match what she has laid out. So that's the devil. Um, Verse 12, Jesus answering said unto him, "It It is said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. All three times, quoting scripture, the word of God. And here's Jesus, 40 days hungered. He's tempted with lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. And the third one, pride of life. Pride of life. And I will submit to you tonight that I believe God calls us to sacrifice our life. Um, who was it come up to me after Sunday school? It was Gary. And he was listening to what I was saying in Sunday school, and the thought came to him. He came running to me, uh, Pastor. He said, you know, I was just sitting there, and, and while you was talking, I, the scriptures come to my mind. I love it when that happens. I don't get offended at that at all. You listen to the Holy Ghost, not me. And he said, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And it just occurred to him. He said, our lives, we just, we're already dead. We're all, when you consider that, we're already dead. This is not our home. This is not where we're going to stay. Then your mind gets set on heaven. And you're ready to go at any time. Amen. And that's, that's Jesus right here. His heart is set toward his father in obedience to his father. Doing things by the book, giving the devil the scriptures of why he believes, what he believes, why he says what he says, why he, what he stands on, what his foundation is, is the word of God and nothing less than that expected from us. So then the devil ended all the temptations. He departed from him for a season. But the devil wasn't done. And when you get a temporary victory in life, do not ever think that the devil is done with you and he's not going to tempt you any further. And you've now passed the point and you're free to go and you're cleared forever for life. Don't ever think that. He said, the Bible said for a season, the season's going to roll back around again. Lindsay, it's going to be deer season again next year. Amen. She can't wait. She said, oh, I'm hooked. I'm going out next Saturday. (laughs) Amen. Just shoot one up close to the house, will you? (laughs) My arm hurts. Turn to 1 John. 1 John gives us the clear understanding. Chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2. Here a little, there a little. 1 John chapter 2, let's get a little... Uh, back up here, verse 15. First John 2, 15. For love not the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. That's the devil's biggest wedge against us to get in our lives, to get us to love just one thing from this world. You may have been delivered from smoking. You may have been delivered from drinking. You may have been delivered from this or that or the other, but I guarantee you the devil's still got a wedge that he, or a thorn 
that he will get into your, into your flesh, your wicked, sinful nature. He will work in that way to try to pull you away from loving God. There will be in your flesh a natural attachment and love to something in this world. But we're leaving. We're called out, separated, cut off from the rest of the world. So that when God gets ready to call us, disconnecting from everything in this world is easy. We don't want to stay here any longer. And I think, I really do think, that Christ is going to make it in that day so that we will just say, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. That's, that's what he said. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16, then, for all that is in the world, that's what I have up on the screen, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. These three things. So this number three, we're going we're gonna to do a little thing on this number tonight. We're going to show you from the scripture typology and patterns in the Bible to give you an understanding of how sin works and how sin is conquered in your life. So he's identifying it, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. So, and Satan is the God of this world, so what he seeks to do is get us attached somehow, some way to loving something in this world. And I, I'm telling you, it, it is not by might, it is not by my power, but the older I get the more I hate this world. I don't see how Adam stood living 930 years. I don't see how he, I, he, I would have gone crazy past 500. I'd have been nuts out of my mind having to deal with all that. Amen, Ron? Good night of life to have to deal with the flesh for 969 years, Methuselah. What were you, what was going on? James, turn to James chapter 1. Same, same pattern here. Uh, Hebrews, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. If you see 1st, 2nd Peter, you've gone too far. James chapter 1. Oh, look at um, verse 12. Get a little context in this. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Like Jesus did. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. And that is eternal life. Not living longer down here. Don't want to do it. I want to live exactly to the split second that God has ordained for me here in this place. And then I want to go home. But until that day, I want to work. I want to do what God called me to do. I want to help people. I want to, I want to reach out to people. Blessed is the man that endureth in temptation. Verse 13. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Think about, and who was Jesus? God. So Jesus is God. And Satan, I don't think he really gets it. I mean, here it is plainly written in Scripture. God cannot be tempted with evil. And the devil has probably read that, but it never registered. He still in his beast mind thinks that he can make Jesus sin. He thinks he can. So he tried it. And it didn't work. So he tried to kill him. That didn't work either. Because number three kicked in. Amen. So God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. No, hold your, hold your hand right there in that place. Turn to Genesis 22. See, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of this Bible. Well, I'm not afraid of what people say about this Bible. Genesis 22, read verse 1.
Read verse 1. Now, James just told us, Neither tempteth he any man. Genesis 22, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him. Now, look up English words. We speak English. This is English. This is God's word. And you find out that the word temptation has a dual split meaning. In our language, it can either mean temptation to do sin or it can mean a trial. And Abraham's faith was tested and your faith has been tested. Has it not, Spencer? Okay, I don't even know what he's talking about. He went, oh yeah. Okay, because I, I mean, I love this guy. I believe he's a real, genuine Christian. And he's honest. Oh yeah, the devil. Yeah, he's, God's, I've been tested. My faith. The day I held a Bible in my hand, saying to my wife, you better tell me this book is true. And she said, you know it is. I was shaken on that day, but God had a reason for it. He was testing my faith and he was teaching me, teaching me how to pray, teaching me how to trust him and only him. And we know what Genesis 22 is. Abraham laid Isaac on an altar because God told him to offer him up, not sacrifice him, offer, offer, offer him up. That is exactly what Abraham did and be before he put the knife in him, the angel of the Lord said, Stop, Abraham. Don't do it. God did not, and this is not written in the text, but God did not tell Abraham to kill his son. But Abraham had it in his mind that even if I kill him, I believe God will raise him back from the dead because God promised me that from Isaac, I would have this mighty nation. From Isaac. So he believed, the scripture tells us that he believed that God would raise Isaac back from the dead. So it's not a contradiction. That was my point in this. It's not a contradiction in scripture. Learn the language first before you start accusing God. Amen. So God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. See, it was there in Eve. It was in me, it was in my wife, it was in her mom and dad, it was in my mom and dad. It's probably more in my sister than it was in me, but we're not going to talk about that now. Nah. But it was there. And the devil dug around until he found it. And he knew what chain to yank. He knew what button to push. And so he says, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Verse 15, you see the pattern then. Then when lust hath conceived. Look at that language. That's a child being born. When lust hath conceived. Who is the Antichrist? He's the man of sin. Man of sin. He is pure. He is the embodiment of pure evil. Lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. That's a birthing term. Sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You see the pattern there. Lust hath conceived, birthed, it is finished, bringeth forth death. You have a pattern of three there. Now, let's go back to, you can follow along with me or just look at the screen on this so I can run through this, okay? I started searching this. I, I knew this number three. I was looking for this number three. What does that mean, God? Show me what that means. Of course, we have resurrection. Three days, he'll rise again. He rose again on the third day. There's a lot of third day patterns in the Bible. We have the Godhead, the Father, the Word, or the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. These three are one. So we know the number three represents the Godhead. We know it represents resurrection. But it also is a pattern on the evil side. It shows you the work and the nature of sin. And it also shows you how Christ conquered that for us to give us victory over sin. So, 
In Genesis chapter, now that Adam has sinned, even though we know from Genesis 2 that Adam and Eve had consummated their marriage, now that they are partnered together in Genesis 3, the devil goes after the wife to get, draw the wife away, entice her, cause her to sin. She sinned. Adam fell into it. And no children were born until after the transgression. Now, it would be curious, what if a child had been conceived and born before that? Well, we don't know, because it didn't happen. So, God's silent, so we're going to be silent too. But it's just interesting thought, but they, they only conceived after their sin. So, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, Adam knew his wife Eve. And she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've got, I've got a man for the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain was a tiller of ground. Now I'm laying this out. The name Adam is mentioned 30 times in your Bible. And Adam is a type of Christ. Notice that number 3 and 3 times 10, 30. Adam mentioned, so we have Adam, the first Adam. He sinned, he fell. We have the second Adam, Christ, who succeeded and raised us from the dead. The first Adam was had a breathed into him a living soul. The second Adam is that living spirit himself, Jesus Christ. So Adam knew his wife. So once Cain killed Abel, Abel's seed, there's no children of Abel. Cain's seed is destroyed in the flood so that we know there are no seed of Cain left anywhere in the world. So now Adam then passed his sin nature down to his third son, Seth. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son called his name Seth. For God said she had appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. So Seth is the third son of Adam and Eve. And Seth is where all of us come from. We come, nobody's comes from Cain. Cain's dead, all of his seed's dead. We all come from Seth. He's the third son of Adam. I'm laying out this pattern for you. So Genesis 6. After Seth, all these children are born. These guys live 900 plus years. You can make a lot of babies in 900 years. Whoa, man. Because it says with each one of them, and they bear sons and daughters. Whoa. Whoa. So these are the, so now, all of the generations of the earth after Seth, were destroyed in the flood with the exception of Noah. And the Bible says, Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So see the sin. Tracking from Adam to Seth, the third son, pass, being passed down through the loins of these men to Noah, who had three sons, and everybody in this room. If Hyun Mi was here, it'd be perfect. Because we have three primary races of people. Mongoloid, which is the Asian people, which is Hyunmi. She's Korean. Negroid. Those are the sons of Ham. Caucasoid. White. Three primary races from Noah's three sons. Sin passed through the third son down to Noah, who passed his sinful nature to his three sons and all of us in this room are the result of one or two or all three of the sons of Noah and God doesn't care what loin you came out of when he decided to save you somebody say amen but it's that pattern of three. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So every one of us are descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Exodus 2. So we get down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those three. By the way, I did a search, John. You can do this with the Pure Bible Search software. Search for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all in the same verse. 33 verses where all three of those names are found. That's Christ. He said, I'm the God of Abraham. I Look at Exodus 2. God heard the groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. These three names are found in 33 verses of the Bible. You can't make that stuff up. 
Genesis 29. Now watch this. Now that we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob is going to give birth to the 12 tribes. So he has, who's the first one? Who remembers the first son of Jacob? Huh? Reuben. Then, who? Simeon. Then who? Who is the third son of Jacob? Look up on the screen. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. Now, the third book of your Bible is Leviticus. Named after Levi. It has 27 chapters in it. That's three times three times three. It's a picture of the New Testament. Because the New Testament has 27 books in it. Three times three times three. And Leviticus, if you've ever read Leviticus, I'd, I ought to. I ought to ask you, who in here has read Leviticus? I ought to ask you. Not, 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 not put your hands down. You should. You should. Because you know what you're going to find? Sin has a price. Sterling, they couldn't take the sick goat to the tabernacle. They couldn't even take a spotted lamb who was healthy to the tabernacle. They had to take the best goat or the best lamb or the best ox or the finest of their fine flour or the purest of their olive oil. They had to take the best, most expensive, county, fair lamb and have it killed. And you can't take, Sterling, my lamb for your family, for you and your family. Because you didn't, it's stealing. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't raise that lamb. You didn't feed that lamb. You didn't nurture that lamb. That lamb cost you a lot of labor, and now you've got to have it handed over to the Levite priest to be slaughtered. But you get something out of it. You get redemption. But sin cost us. Do we not all know that? You kids? Hey, kids, look at me for a minute. Hey, up here, look up here, look up here. When you commit evil sins, you're going to pay the price for it. Michaela, I want to tell you a story about your grandpa. When I was a little boy, my sister and her and our cousin was walking through a neighborhood, a street, a sidewalk. We were visiting my grandparents down in Arkansas. And I was a little boy. And I ran down to find where my sister and my cousin Debbie was. And they were walking down this sidewalk. Well, there was some boys playing on this sidewalk. They had a big sinker. You know what a sinker is? It goes on a fishing pole made out of lead it's real heavy they had a big lead sinker tied to a shoestring and they were throwing it up in the air to see how high they could make it go I didn't know these boys who they were but I joined in with them and I said can I try that so they gave me this heavy sinker lead sinker Tied to this string, and I threw it way up, right over into this huge glass window of these people's house. <laughs> Broke the whole thing. I took off running. 
All the way back to me, mom, and Peepaw's house. Because I thought, they won't know who I am. So I come back, and my mom and my dad, my grandma and grandpa, my uncle and my aunt, they were all sitting outside. And mom saw me. She said, what are you doing? Nothing. She looked at you, Giga. She was waiting for you to go. Uh Uh-huh, that's how it was. No, son, what, what did you do? I didn't do nothing. A few minutes later, here come some people walking down the driveway where we were. And my mom and dad went to talk to him. How much did that cost? $50 in 1973, 74, somewhere around in there. It would be about 500 bucks now. My mom said, you're going to pay for that window. Now, I'm a little boy, Michaela. How much money do I have? You have lots of money? Good. I'm going to give you a string with an anchor on it. <laughs> Me and you is going to take a walk. Okay? So my mom said, no, I'm going to take it out of your hide. Now, I didn't understand what that meant until she started whipping on me. Yeah, my mom was trying to save my little life. Yeah, I was pretty good at breaking windows. But see, I lied to my mom. I did something bad and I ran away from it and it caught up with me. And my mom gave me a very severe spanking. Bad one. And I learned then what taking it out of my hide meant. Sin costs, doesn't it? When you read Leviticus, you're reading, God's given you knowledge of the price of sin. Those people... Israel did not get away with their sins. They paid a price for it. Let me, hey kids, listen to me for a second. It got so bad with Israel. Do you know what a famine is, Michaela? A famine? It doesn't rain for several years, so no corn, no wheat. No grass grows, nothing. All the animals die, the chickens die, the cows die, the pigs die. And they have no food to eat. Nothing. So you know what they did? They started eating their own babies. The Israelites. They did. God was so angry with Israel over their repeated sin that he put a famine in the land that was so bad, those people were so hungry, they killed their own children and ate them. And God said that would happen. You never, ever get away with sin. Us adults say amen to that. We've lived the life. We know what it takes and we know the price that we've paid for the things we've done. So now, let's go to Jesus. He's 30 years old. See this number? He's 30 years old when he starts preaching. That was according to the law. The law said the priest could not, if you were in the Levite tribe, you could not begin service as a Levite priest until you were 30 years old. And here Jesus shows up 30 years old but he's not a Levite, he's a Judah. He's different. Okay? 30 years old when he begins preaching. And he's 33. He's 33 years old when he hangs on the cross. And in Matthew 27, that's three times three times three, verse three says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver. There was a cost to this. 
A price had to be paid. So here's Jesus in the middle, and he's got two thieves, one on each side. So they're on Golgotha, there are three crosses. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. So Mark 15, 28 says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith he was numbered with the transgressors. Numbered, that number three. So John 19, 30. Ron, look at this, look at this. The last three words that Jesus said was, It is finished. Right? The only place in the whole Bible where that phrase is mentioned is in James 1.15. Then when sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Because Jesus, when he said those words, bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It literally happened the way the Bible said it was going to happen. Sin is why we die. Sin is why our parents died. And our grandparents. And our children and our grandchildren. And our cousins and our aunts and our uncles. All of our family that we love. Sin is why they all died. There's a price to pay. Amen? So turn to Second Chronicles. And I'll let you go. This was, I think, if I remember right, like the second sermon I preached in my life and I didn't really fully understand it then the way I do now but in 2nd Chronicles 20 Jehoshaphat is king and I think what drew me to that passage was the name Jehoshaphat because it had the word fat in it Jehosh is fat like that doe Lindsay killed yesterday. She was fat, wasn't she? She was a little fatty. She, was a little, she killed a heifer. She didn't kill a deer. She killed a heifer. Jehoshaphat realized that he had three armies, Spencer, coming to get him. Three armies. Thousands upon thousands of men. So... Jehoshaphat says, verse 10, Now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir. There's the three. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade when they come out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession. Watch this. Sin will cost you your own possessions, will it not? You men fool around on your wife. It's going to cost you half of your stuff. They cast us out of thy possession which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And you know the meaning of that, don't you? Try telling yourself that you're not going to sin this week. Try telling yourself that. Try telling yourself you're not going to have a dirty thought toward anybody or about anybody. You're not going to say anything. You're not going to tell a lie. You're not going to do anything. Try telling yourself that you have power over your own flesh. Because you don't. You don't have power over sin. So, verse 14. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, a Levite. Look at there. He's from the third tribe, isn't he? Of the sons of Asaph came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation and said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou king Jehosh, Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Christ fought that battle because you couldn't stand up to him. I preached on bullies this morning. Yeah, I told him, Mama. You told me to hit him. And it just wasn't in me. But I couldn't stand up to the bullies. Some of the women that I know that had been beaten by husbands couldn't stand up to them. 
and you can't stand up to sin, you can't defeat it. It's not possible. Joel Osteen might tell you it is. Joyce Meyer might tell you if you just think good thoughts all the time, you'll never do anything wrong. She's lying through her teeth if she says that she always thinks good thoughts. She is lying through her fake lips. Amen? And I'm going to expose her. I'm going to go through those books while Lisa's laying suffering in the hospital. And I'm going to pull out all her witchcraft. And I'm going to tell everybody in the world that she's a witch. Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And it, God meant it. The next day, those three armies, God said, you guys, go up, you guys go get up on the hill and sing Amazing Grace and the Old Rugged Cross. You go up there and sing praises to me, and I'll, I'll come down here and fight the battle for you. And those three armies came down and met. They destroyed themselves. Sin will do that. And those caught up in sin will eat up one another. There's no honor among and sinners. Okay, so they all came down and to me it's the funniest thing in the whole Bible. They come down, they each, God turned their minds and twisted their heads around so they all thought that the other armies were the Jews. So they killed all of the, they all killed one another. And I would love to have seen the last two guys with swords going, Wow. I would love to see that, Uriah. Yes. So then, back then, Michaela, back then, all those soldiers always carried all their golden idols with them. They carried all their money, all their expensive weapons. And for, I don't know how many, probably three days, I don't know, but for several days, the Jews went through their camps picking up all their gold, all their silver, all their swords, all their money, all their stuff and spoiled them. God gave them the victory over the battle that they could not fight themselves. Amen? Jesus did what Adam and Eve could not do. Let him do it. Take your sins to the cross. Amen?